Let me test you guys, okay? Oh, boy. Because mm-hmm. I always had trouble with the libertarians in the administration. How do you guys feel about tariffs on China? And, uh, well, give me a little bit more detail. Like, uh... So, so if, okay, so <clears throat> in the In Trump Time book, there's a great scene where I do go mano a mano with Chris Wallace on his Sunday show. Oh, right? for you. And it's like we're in each other's face, and he goes, what, what's the problem with China? I go, and it just pops out of my head because it's Sunday, right? It's biblical. I go, the seven deadly sins, right? Oh. And so I go, okay, so here's the problem. <laughs> it's, it's even get all seven. It's always, it's always a chore, okay? <laughs> okay, you start with the intellectual property theft to, mm-hmm. to the tune of half a trillion dollars a year. You got forced technology transfer, which is if you want to go and do business in China, um, you got to hand over your technology, right? Totally unfair trade. You've got the the constant cyber hacking, both of personal individuals for their credit card, whatever, but also businesses, right? Stealing their IP, another form. You've got what's called dumping, which is sending product below cost into markets as a way of pushing the the domestic producers out and, and grabbing hold of those markets. You have China's state-owned enterprises. I'm up to five now, right? Yeah, See, these are the these are the national champions. They send out with the with the full power of the state to go out and do battle. And why why it's China building our subway systems instead of American companies? Um, currency manipulation, yep. which is like China lowers the value of their currency, which makes their exports here cheaper and our our exports to them more expensive so our trade deficit goes up and then there's the seven uh is the killing of americans with deadly fentanyl and that's both a health crisis as well as an economic thing because a lot of the people who die from fentanyl um, are uh, working age manufacturing blue collar workers okay so um the the libertarian the traditional libertarian view is that well if china wants to sell us cheap goods we should just benefit from them and what i'm going is no 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 it's like <laughs> that's a form of economic aggression if you take it as like a snapshot and you go into walmart and stuff cheap that's cool okay that's what but if you play it like as a movie over time and all your jobs go offshore and your wages are driven down and people go to the unemployment line and, and workers wind up committing suicide because they don't have jobs. That's a serious thing. So I get back and, in the, and like in the in Trump time book, I identify this this set of what I call the Wall Street transactionalists like Mnuchin at Treasury, Kudlow at the National Economic Council, Mulvaney, big libertarian. It's like I try to do like buy American policies or China tariffs, and these guys freak out. So I, I'll throw it back to you guys, libertarian. Do you do tariffs on China well, there's, to there's, protect yourself? Well, there's two different libertarians now. You've got yeah. the Mises Caucus and you've got the establishment, you know, old school type libertarians, and they disagree on a lot of things. Yeah. So I think uh, the Mises guys are like pro-borders, right? I, yeah, very much so. I yeah. think so, yeah. yeah. So they're probably going to say we have to protect American workers in America, and then I think their view is more like within the area that we can protect, we have libertarian values and views on how things are run, Yeah. but we recognize, you know, outside of the borders – so I, 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 I don't know if that's exactly their view, but I would say my view is, is, is similar to that. Like, I don't want China ripping off American workers using uh, economic coercion and warfare to try and destroy this country. So everything within the borders, I believe in, you know, we have very libertarian individual liberties, individual rights, civil rights, et cetera. And then when it comes to international trade and stuff, we must protect the people in our, in our community. Here's an interesting stat for you folks. <clears throat> our trade deficit with China is roughly equivalent to the People's Liberation Army defense budget. Huh. So, and, and by the way, uh, it's Tuesday, and Friday is not just Friday. It is Black Friday. Mm-hmm. And that's when everybody's going to be going to the big box, baby, Walmart, Target, whatever. And a lot of that stuff they're going to buy uh, when they pick up that Made in China stuff is actually going to be uh, you know, plows, uh, plows into uh, swords, plowshares into swords, because that stuff is, uh, that money, our trade deficit, goes to fund all of their weapons. And 
I, what drives me nuts is is you ask at the beginning who I am. It's like the way I met Donald Trump. And I talk about it in the Trump Time book because there was some, some confusion there. I wrote a trilogy of China books, right? 2006, The Coming China Wars. 2011, The Death by China book and film. And then those were economic based. And then 2015, Crouching Tiger. Uh, which was the rise of the Chinese military. So, like, in 2015, I write this book and say, yeah, China's developing these hypersonic missiles that can kill us with nuclear weapons, right? Okay, so that's, like, six years ago. And so China, just a couple of weeks ago, they fly a hypersonic uh, plane around in low orbit, which is capable of bristling with weapons, and everybody's go, wow, wow, that's surprising. Oh, my gosh. No, it's not. It's like, in 2006... Uh, I predicted uh, in the coming China wars that China would create a global pandemic because of the way they handled the viruses. And it was based on my research of how SARS-1 came about. My point here is that China is an existential threat. You got, you got Joe Biden say it's no, no, it's just simply a competitor. And part of what I've been trying to do uh, and what President Trump was absolutely transformative about was to raise people's awareness, as they used to say in the 60s, about the, the threat of, of communist China, the Chinese Communist Party coming after us. And they're coming after us, and uh, there so, it is. So what, what, what do the tariffs do? How, how will that help? First? So the way tar- tariffs work, um, <clears throat> if, you, if, you, if, you, if, if you have a co- country like China that is dumping product in or stealing or whatever, the tariffs, uh, first and foremost, offset the advantage that they've gotten from the unfair trade. So that's your first best, right? But what we were also trying to do with China um, was to get them to the bargaining table. So in some sense, the tariffs were a penalty for things like intellectual property theft or currency manipulation. So I th- it was fascinating. The, the, the first chapter of the book, I call it the Red Wedding chapter uh, in, in homage to Game of Thrones, mm. but we're sitting, we're sitting there in the East Wing and the president's about to sign this, this skinny trade deal where we're supposed to deal with this economic uh, 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 aggression. And um, it's like I'm fighting the Wall Street transactionalists because all they were concerned is if China buys some more soybeans or whatever. They weren't focused on the core problem. But we had this strategy. It was called dragon in a pot. Like, think about this. It's like we knew that there would be resistance to tariffs initially among a certain segment of the public. But to get people to accept them, what we did, what pre- this was brilliant, President Trump, he, he got China to enter into negotiations. Every time China did something in those negotiations which was unfair, we'd raise the tariffs. And that allowed us over time to steadily increase yeah. the tariffs to over three billion, $100 billion wow. of tariffs. And in a second term, I'll say this for the record, and I've talked many times with the president about this, we would have completely raised the tariffs on everything to 100% and began to do what I believe has to be done, which is decouple from yeah. communist China. Because every time China makes another dollar off the United States or Europe or whatever, um, it, it's able to fuel both its military machine, but also the, the war China's conducting, like through the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. I don't know if you guys have yeah. talked oh, yeah. about yes, that. Of course. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, so it's basically the colonization of Africa, Latin America, Kazakhstan, and everything like that. I mean, they've, they've got a strategy, and the advantage they have over us as a democracy is that um, we change governments and officials every, every four years, right? And uh, these guys that I would uh, see, you, I sat um, in Osaka, the G20 across from Xi Jinping and his married band of apparatchiks. Same thing in Buenos Aires. Uh, many times I, w- I went to Beijing. I, th- these, my point here is that these guys across the table had been there for years and they will be there for years yeah. and I'll be gone. And, and, and instead now in, in Biden land, they've got a bunch of uh, uh, appeasers and people who, here, here's the way they do this, Tim. It's like, they, like there's money pots and honey pots, 
Okay. The honey pot is Eric Swalwell in yeah. California, right? <laughs> yes. Sleeping his way up and down the coast with a Chinese spy. I, just, uh, I joked he had like STDs, like spy transmitted diseases, right? <laughs> that's, that's the honey pot, right? But the money pots are, are much more insidious because what China will do with government officials is like they'll give them like trips to Beijing or they'll put them in the think tank. They'll give them grants at universities. And these people become beholden to uh the chinese and then they wind up like jake sullivan is the national security advisor right i mean it's this is crazy yeah. stuff well there's well those well they'll just do uh, business dealings with uh, biden's sons and and, and i agree with your point yeah. when it comes to decoupling especially from china's pharma industry which the united states yeah. is heavily reliant yeah. on but i think previously what you were describing was globalization instead of libertarianism because when we look at what China's doing, they're, they're, they're treating China like a conduit for a multinational corporate takeover of the world. And people are yeah. using China as a slave factory to produce the goods. But this was all started under Henry Kissinger, who yes. literally took manufacturing <laughs> jobs from oh. the United States, deindustrialized, I, 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 and then took all the jobs to China. Yeah. And now China now has taken a lot of workforce, a lot of economic opportunities from the American people. And obviously, if someone steals yeah. from you, that's not libertarianism there should be consequences and you should have a right to yeah. contract with who you want to contract with and we shouldn't be contracting with people who are stealing from us so that libertarian kind of idea still holds strong to me but because of the multinational corporations having so much power and influence buying out the u.s government we don't have libertarianism we don't even have capitalism we have socialism for the super rich which is orchestrated by elites like kissinger you well, had a, you I, had a, bit, I, you had a take, strong reaction I, to kissinger. I take a really good short but nice yeah. shot at, at Henry. Yes, he's 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 a, he's you know, the dumbest one of the dumb smart guys you meet along the way who's made millions and millions and millions of dollars from that. The funny thing about these corporations, though, the funny thing about these corporations and, and General Electric is the poster child for this. All of these American corporations who thought they could go over to China, offshore uh, all the jobs and things like that, wound up getting destroyed over there. They got stripped of their technology, and they wound up having competitors over there who were Chinese. And then if you look like GE, it's like it hit its peak. It was at its apex. Then the moment it started to go over to China, that was the end of that corporation. Now, I, I, again, I'm old enough to remember when GE was the most important and powerful corporation in the world today. It's like... China just took that. Thanks for checking out this segment from the Timcast IRL podcast. If you want to watch live, you can check out this channel Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. Now, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to this channel. And if you want more unfiltered and uncensored content with all of these guests, go to Timcast.com and become a member. All of these guests you know and love in exclusive segments on our website where we are unrestricted in what we talk about so you'll definitely not want to miss it. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you all next time.